be going to 7.1. Um, I don't know whether you want to note this, but then we'll be going to 9.3, then 8.1. 9.1, 9 9.2, 8, 9, 10, 11, and page 12. <clears throat> Can I have a mover? Uh, but these are uh, accurate. accurate. Uh, Councillor Wilson, seconded by uh, Councillor Lambert. Thank you. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Carried. Thank you. Uh, going on to our chair's report, um, thank you, our chair, our previous chairperson, our, our current chairperson um, online, uh, Piggy Tiora Hingoa, would you like to read your report, please? All right. Um, before I do, just a uh, uh, mahi out to uh, uh, the mayor, our councillors, and everyone around the table. Thank you, um, our deputy chair, um, Jill, Councillor Duncan, for stepping in. Um, so, my chair's report, more than well, Kia ora koutou and welcome to our June Policy and Planning Hui. Firstly, an acknowledgement to our newest councillor, Paul Sharland, for winning the recent North Southern Ward by-election in April. Paul brings his extensive knowledge and wisdom as a long-time resident in the Southern Rangitike. No mai haere mai te rangatira. Over the last two months, our staff continue to work diligently in the background, ensuring that we have been kept up, kept up to date and on point with the raft of government policy amendments that have, that have influence and an effect on our communities. Today's agenda sees us looking at our policy bylaw work program and drone policy review, review of the strategy plan development, and also section 17A review of the camping grounds. Just to also remind our community, we are currently going through a consultation process for the draft smoke green vape policy and the draft signs in public places bylaw. This consultation process finishes on Monday, the 1st of July. So we would appreciate community feedback on this co Uh Piki te ora, Chairman. Uh, Chairman. Uh, sorry, Kelda. Yeah. Happy to remove my report unless people have got questions. Any questions? No, not a question at this but I'll can I make a statement just after this. So can I have a seconder for um Piketty Order's report? Thank you, Councillor Lambert. All in favour? Aye. Against carriage, thank you. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Uh, I sent an email out to councillors with regard to this this morning. Um, Councillor Jeff Wong has expressed an interest to be part of this committee. I have the, the right and powers to be able to appoint. Um, and I know that the chair and deputy chair have been in agreement with this. So it will be followed up by formal notification um, in terms of the next meeting of council, but because I have that power and have appointed, he would then be, as of this time, be a member in my view of the committee and therefore have the right not only to speak, but so long as that speaking is aligned to my values, I value that. <laughs> um, so he would become now part of the quorum as well. So right. just to clarify, as of today? As of now, when the appointment is in as in practice. Thank you. Well, welcome, Councillor Wong, to this um, to this committee. I'm sure we'll be all the richer for your presence and your voting. I shouldn't say that on the air, actually. But, yeah. <laughs> and, and no, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, the live streaming has come up with an error, I've just been told again. So we are recording it and we will put it online after the meeting. Thank you. Very good. Moving on to um, reports of a decision. And we can go to 9.3. I'll be part of That's right. We're going to 
which is page 41. So we, um, so thank you for your indulgence to move the agenda around as staff availability. Um, so Johan is here to actually give the committee a presentation on some stats around the regulatory group. So he's created this um, presentation for us and he'll go through that and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hillis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm happy to go through the presentation um, with you. Uh, at any time, please stop me and ask questions as we go through. I thought I'd start off with just everybody normally asks, well, what is regulatory about? And we, we get different answers all the time and different perceptions. So hopefully after this session, councillors will, will be able to make a decision of which one of those are, are most relevant to um, to regulatory. So um, we'll just leave it there for a few seconds just to let it sink in. Um, and obviously, I don't 100% agree with the with the last uh, photo, but it, some days it feels like that. <clears throat> Moving on. Oh, you got a question. Oh, beg your pardon. Aroha mai. I can't see what it says. I can see the photos. Can someone just read that, read out the... So the first one is playing the, playing the ukulele for the children is what my friends think I do. The second one is being smacked in a classroom, what my parents think I do. Uh, the third one is in a hammock, what the client thinks I do. Sleeping underneath the desk is what other can capabilities at my company think I do. Is that right? Yeah. And the, uh, the middle one is sitting there looking very professional. Uh, what I think I do. And the third one on the bottom is head and hands, what I really do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So just to start off with some stats, I'll start with um, with building control. And normally we we provide an overview of um, consents sort of issued with uh, annual plan uh, report. But this gives us a much better picture of um, how that work breaks down per department. Um, so for 23-24, and this is just up till 6th of June, we've done 2,336 inspections. Um, and we see that for, for, for this um, financial year, our peak times were basically July, August, and September of, um, sorry, June, July, August, and um, slowly starting to drop down in September of 2023 and then drastically um, reducing as the year has been going on, showing what is happening in, in the sector. Although per financial year, and I'll give a little bit of more explanation, uh, our inspections haven't dropped that much from, um, from 22, 23. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll just comment on that a, a, a little bit later. So, what we are battling with at the moment is out of those totals, 46% um, um, currently on average fail um, uh, inspections. So that increases our demand for, for inspections. And at the moment, um, as of today, we have got about a waiting period of two days to um, achieve an inspection slot. Um, Moving on, unless there's any questions. So what is important as well as every every now and then we when we give some stats, we, we normally talk about building consents issued rather than received. But what, what is interesting is if we look at um, consents received over the years, we already see that in this financial year, um, we are only tracking at 181 consents for the year versus 252 for, for last year. 
And what this basically um, affects is revenue for um, mm. for the department. And if we look at our revenue structure, it means that um, from our fees and charges, a certain percentage needs to come from 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 that aspect for us to continue doing the the work. Um, and I'll I'll just. Uh, uh, as a reminder, if we look at the next um, slides uh, further down, um, why you you might have a question as to why the totals don't equate to issued. So please just remember we we just talking about received in a financial year, not not issued. All right. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, in, in that mixture as well, we, we don't normally um, uh, appreciate that amendments, although there's only 43 in, in this um, financial year, some of the amendments, um, if they're complex enough, it means that, that um, application's almost got to be reprocessed from, from start to finish. Um, which also increases the the workload for um, for the building control staff, and then just a, a quick update on CCCs. So um, issued for each financial year, um, which is more or less uh, the, the same for the last two um, financial years. And please just bear in mind again, um, it's only up till the sixth of June, so we still got the rest of the. Um, month to go. Um, and at this stage, we are about, on average, it takes us about six days to um, issue a CCC. Another question for Mr. Bishop? Um, and, and when you mentioned the, the revenue drop in terms of the department, 22-23, um, we were struggling with the capacity, so we contracted out some of that work, didn't we? Correct, and we still do, Your Worship. So, um, and I'll I'll talk about that just a little bit later on when we break it down into um, categories. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Slide. So. Still looking at um, building consents, and um, your worship, this is where, where I'll just uh, comment on on what you've um, indicated now. So, under each of the categories, we we're looking at different um, categories of of buildings. So, our bread and butter is still in uh, Res One, which is your less complicated um, structures, and that could be anything from a um, a dwelling to a pole shed to a fireplace. And then as you go up the risk matrix, um, res two and, and three is, is your sort of larger residential um, homes. Um, and in com, uh, commercial one, two, and three, the, the, the same um, uh, applies. So the, the greater the risk, the, the more complex the, the consent. And for us, we are, we've got capability in-house to process and inspect from residential one to three and from comms one to comms two. We don't have the capability in the house to process comms three. So those we um, uh, ship out to an external contractor, um, your worship, um, plus overflows uh, of, of any of the other um, categories. And then when it comes to inspections for um, comms three, we rely on our neighbors like Wanganui that helped us with um, Tomato P. Questions? Um, and at the moment, sorry, just before we move on, um, we're sitting on an average of 10 days to um, process a a consent. And, and the requirement is 20 working days. 20 working days. Yeah. And same thing for CCCs. So I have a question just to clarify. So when you say 10 days, that is 10 working days. 10 working days, yeah. yeah. On average. Yeah. Thank you. 
Right, and then uh, I think with the last um, one on uh, building consents, um, and this is where my previous comment came in. So these are actually issued uh, consents. So if we look at our current um, financial year, uh, compared to last year, um, 196 versus 280. So we can see that drastic um, turnaround in the in the industry, um, and also in terms of what we are um, issuing um, per uh, financial year. And the reason why there's a, a variance in um, applications received and um, issued is that from financial year to financial year, we carry over consents, and that could be for different reasons, such as waiting for information or amendments have, have come in and we haven't reissued or issued that consent. So sometimes it, there's a bit of a lag period there in terms of um, what is received and what is issued in, in a year. Any questions on? On that, no, right, really? moving on. So now we look at resource consents. Um, and uh, again, we just broken it up um, to give you a little bit more idea of what we do in each of the different um, sectors and the, the underlying work in, in there as well. So anything from um, the normal subdivisions and um, land use consents, um, but we also do uh, the outline plans um, and right of ways uh, deemed permitted uh, boundaries. And then also in the different um, categories of resource consents, i.e., you know, um, other controlled discre discretionary um, uh, consents. And that gives us a bit of an idea of how um, that is broken up as well. Very much um, the same over the financial year. Again, just bearing in mind that um, last year, 114. This year, we had 108, but we also still got June to, to go through. So I expect that we all sort of um, be more or less in the same ballpark with... Um, with resource consents uh, this this year. Any questions? No. Moving on. And then just to um, show a little bit of what we do in, in the other sectors. So um, in uh, health premises, so we have um, 81 uh, food premises that have been renewed. We've got nine new food premises, one other. So other could be anything from uh, a hairdresser um, or any of those other um, premises that we, we normally look after. It could be uh, undertaker, it could be um, uh, a barber or, or, or something like that as, as well. And then renewed others is um, 19 for, for the year. Um, and then if we look at, I know we, we do give you a bit of an overview of um, our liquor uh, premises, um, but just to break it down a little bit further in terms of um, what has been happening this year in, in relation to the different um, premises. And then um, a large component of that manages uh, licenses as, as well. Questions? So um, another part that we do quite regularly is, is limbs. And um, again, um, the, the figures are quite um, close to each other for, for each of the financial years, um, 117 versus 123. And um, the only slight change there is that in 2022 to 2023, it took us on average uh, three days to process. And now we at um, four days. Again, um, we've got 10 working days to process a, a, a limb. Okay. I'll just ask a question around limbs so this would normally be 
people coming into the front office asking for that information or online? No, Your Worship, it's it's a mixture, but a majority online. And the, the charge for to look at a limb? Um, the charge to look at a file is we don't create a limb when, when you ask for, for files. So I'm not 100% sure of the, but I think it's about $10, $15 to look at a property file. Um, it's quite different when you ask for a full limb report. And you can you can ask to look at somebody else's limb? Somebody else's property, yes. I'm just, I'm, the reason I ask is just informing other people that are online and at the table. Good, thank you. Yeah. So, and then um, just looking at service requests um, overall, uh, what we deal with from a regulatory um, point of view. So, in total, um, 1,904 um, requests for for council for the, for for the year. Um, or sorry, just for for us um, and. Uh, those sectors are, are broken up in animal control, environmental health. Um, please just note there that <clears> under <throat> environmental health, we also have the planners that get a large amount of inquiries um, via the request for service um, system. And then uh, building control, 245 and um, bylaws, uh, 24. Um, and then um, Please just note further there that for animal control, um, this is just for RDC. So because we still service MDC, they do about um, 1,200 service requests in, in MDC. And um, they still have on top of that, if we go to the, the other slide, about another 7,000 dogs uh, mm -hmm. roughly in in uh, MDC as well with, with R5,058 um, uh, dogs, yeah. Um, currently, we're just in the new cycle of um, re-registering. So at the moment, we've only got five unregistered dogs, um, but that will change drastically as um, the new um, registration season kicks in and it will leave the team with anything from um, about 600 to 800 unregistered dogs to follow up um, and that's in in each district so uh, MDC being a little bit higher as well than we normally start off with with just over a thousand un unregistered dogs mm -hmm. to, to follow up so it keeps the teams uh, quite um, busy yeah. and thank you just uh... so and just then um, in terms of um, giving councillors a bit of an idea so this is what we would look at um, our enforcement toolbox. So if, if we look at the amount of work that we do and then the type of um, enforcement that, that we take in, in general over those sectors, not including um, animal control, um, but we basically only issue um, 11 infringements um, over the year, 27 notices to fix. So. We try each and every other method before we really go down to the uh, avenue of um, in enforcement. Um, and so that's our last resource is, is, to, um, is to issue other um, infringements or notices to fix. Um, and then just as a side, over and above all of that, we still uh, renew a building warrant of, of fitnesses every year. 172 of, of them as, as well. Um, so happy to take any any questions um, over there. No? And then just lastly, this is from my friend Dave. It's not paying attention in the corner there. And this is why I rather prefer to do um, regulatory than bean counting. Um, who wants to look at, at, at like that at, at 32? But hey, he still feels great, so... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think there was a particularly good photo of Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to take any further questions. Yes, any further questions? Yes, Councillor. Oh, just those days um, 
for doing the, you know, you know what you're talking about, the 10 days and the two days and all that. So do you, like, within law, you have to do it by set? Do you regulate the flow of work or just what happens when you start, when it gets really busy? Well, sometimes when it really gets busy, there is times that we will unfortunately exceed our, um, <coughs> our, our days, but right. just depending on in what uh, sector is it, uh, we are, are dealing in. Uh, most of the times we can um, prioritize. Um, so at the moment for the for the financial year, um, without jinxing it too much, we've only missed two building consents um, out of the um, whole, uh, I think it's 182 that we've issued. So we're sitting at 98%, but by law, we are... Um, we need to be on a hundred percent at um, any given uh, time. Um, so there is there is other mechanisms that we try and use, but sometimes for unforeseen reasons, we we do go over those um, statutory uh, time limits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Councillor Hero, question. Councillor Hero. Kilda. Uh, I just wanted to um, make a comment and say um, that it's good to have this type of feedback to get a really uh, um, a really good overview of what the mahi is, is involved in yours in this section of things. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for the um, the presentation. It's been it's been eye opening and to look at all of that to to look at actually the work that that's involved uh, within this space. So thank you. Um, Councillor Adam. Just with the um, building consent um, uh, trending, um, you get an early indication as to how that side of um, you know, the um, district is going. Do, do you link in with um, Joe Kelkin and Economic Wellbeing Officer regarding those? Do you have conversations around that? Um, we do have internal uh, conversations. The, the problem always is with with how it's it's trending. Our budgets are normally set uh, about six months be before that, so we always in a catch up uh, mode to try and predict what is happening in, in the sector. Um, but definitely, uh, once we we know um our trend is downwards then then we adjust in in, in those areas because yeah. yes. um <coughs> make sure this is my leading question but how how many are there properties that you're aware of that take out a consent for for instance a house that has gone through various stages but never have completed a CCC, in other words, never been signed off. We are, Your Worship. So there's there's two aspects to, to that. As um, part of, of uh, mandated legislation, at 24 months, each BCA has to make a decision whether to issue a CCC or, or not. So every 24 months, with any active... Um, building consent that's out there, we have to make that decision to either grant or refuse the CCC at that stage. And so that leaves us in in uh, the aspect of there's quite a few of, of those that sit in, in that category. So the follow-up question is that, is that it is therefore possible for someone to go through this process not to be signed off but effectively live in a house that is unrated. Correct. I think, Madam Chair, there is an opportunity to take this as a as an issue to to government through a possible a possible remit, and maybe that's something that um, staff might want to consider the consequences of that or opportunity to do so um, to come back to council. So are you asking? Oh, I'm just asking a question, really. How many do you think would fall into that category? We can run a report to say how um, many um, we currently it's... got that still requires a CCC. Okay, back if it is, if it is an issue. So would that um, 
Yes, yes. So the, the reason I rated it, Madam Chairman, as um, acting chairperson, is that um, I'm concerned that somebody can go through this process, ensure they won't get insurance, or <coughs> likely to get insurance, not not a given, but can then effectively be unrated. And um, that's, a, that's a concern that the process allows for. Thank you, Council Now, sorry, sorry, would you like to reply to that, Mr. Cullis? Oh, that's, sorry, if I, if, yes. if I may, there's just a consideration there. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for your worship, is that um, our, our friends that do their evaluations, they will decide when they are actually going to um, attach a new value to a, a, a property. So at this stage, they are waiting for the CCC to be issued. But in terms of um, if, if somebody went out and valued the property, even if there wasn't a CCC in place, and then saying, well, we can see that property is is worth $350,000, they can then still rate for it. But it's, it's what the agreement is between us and a QV as to when they um, determine the the value of a of a property. Um, uh, sorry to delay this, prolong this conversation. Um, I'd welcome that, yeah. but whether there needs to be a process that these properties are caught up with, that especially prior to the end of June, because the valuation would kick in first of July normally. Um, and I say normally because you can, there is a process in which you could do it later. But whether there is, a, uh, we go through that list and have a look at how many of those properties exist and bring it to the attention of QV. So we could call it to their attention. That's Adam. Just your relationship with QV, um, when someone puts in the building consent, um, I think they estimate how much the works is going to cost Correct. in their building consent. Do you then share that figure with QV as part of QV's evaluation of what the buildings will? Correct. So through you, Madam Chair, um, there's two processes that, that happens with QV. Each building consent that comes in that they have got um, specific interest in, so not fireplaces and the, the smaller type of, of consents, um, we send them a monthly list of, of all of those uh, building consents with the building plans. And so they are 100% uh, a fair of uh, what is going to be uh, built. But then they also ask for when that is completed that they get the CCC list. And that's when they apply um, the, the estimated uh, values on, on that building consent. Very good. Any further questions? No, thank you. So I'm happy to um, move the receipt of that report to regu regulatory statistics. <laughs> uh, second that. <coughs> a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Wong. Um, all in favour? Aye. Carried, thank you. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Mr. Thank Phyllis, you. It's excellent. Um, so now we're now going to 8.1, which is on page 14. Uh, reports for decision, um, and that is uh, Ms. Gray's department. Thank you. Great. Right, I'll take you very, really quickly. You'll recall before the last policy planning committee meeting, we had a workshop to talk about what the purpose and the terms of reference for that committee should be. Um, what I've done following that discussion is form it into written terms of reference. I have given you the past terms of reference as well so that you can compare. Um, so reference page 18 of your agenda for the draft terms of reference. What we're looking for from you today is for you to discuss what's in there, make amendments, and then if you're happy um, to confirm them. Well, sorry, Your Worship. 
Right. Good, but taken out the small um, paper. The, uh, the only one that I'd raise is the committee involvement in terms of submissions. So in the, in the ideal world, um, every submission should come through council process somewhere. The reality at the moment is that's proving to be impossible. Um, because government is moving so quickly that it just doesn't allow a time frame for that to happen. Mm. But should that be, should there be a reference to that with regard to how submissions should be received or filed in the, on that committee? I'm looking for expert advice here. We can certainly provide, uh, uh, make a change to that section. Um, the Mayor's quite correct that timeframes don't allow for um, formal adoption by Council or by the Policy Planning Committee. Um, so we set up a process probably six months a year ago now um, to make sure that all councillors had a chance to have their say. So we can we can make a kind of typo on point five under terms of reference to better reflect that process. Yeah. So what are you asking for? Is clarity on the process that goes through because it is provided for the it's provided to under point five but yeah. i'm really wanting to highlight that person um, the process doesn't come with it but having a register of where we have submitted is probably useful within that space yeah i'm happy to Uh, yes, Councillor Wilson. I'm looking to move receipt recommendation one. Thank you. Seconded by <coughs> Worship the Mayor. Thank you. All in favour? Yeah. No. Uh, recommendation two. Are we going straight on to that one? Any further questions? Of, of the bill? No. Thank you. Um, that the policy can committee confirms with or without amendment. So with amendment. Would someone like to move that? Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Seconded by Councillor Lambert. <laughs> <laughs> Just one L. <laughs> <laughs> All in favour? <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, excellent. So now we will go on. Thank you. That's great. It was good. And go on to 9.1, which is actually page 33, I believe. Find it. Right, I'll introduce it um, briefly while you find it. This is one of your regular updates on the strategy and plan development and review that's happening across council. I'll largely take the report as read, but we do just want to highlight two key areas. Um, the first is around the National Planning Standards Implementation. So what that is, is transferring the format and structure of our district plan into what is the National Planning Standards. So that means it's going to be consistent across the entire country. Um, as part of that, we have um, engaged an e-plan provider to transform that, that plan into an e-plan. Uh, so that's going to be really exciting for our district. It's a much more user-friendly um, approach to people accessing district plan information. Councillor Lambert? Does it maintain our quality? I would say it improves our quality. Oh, improves? Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Can I just ask, is that one, there's one that went through Horrifanoa, was it, and recently they approved the e-plan? Yeah, yeah, so is it the same provider? No. no. Same thing. Same thing, yeah. Um, and then we've got Ms Gower here today to give an update on the urban growth plan change. Mm -hmm. Kind of. <laughs> um, I'm here to present uh, the Efficiency and Effectiveness Monitoring Report for the Residential and Rural Living Zones. So hopefully you would have seen that attached. Um, and effectively, you will recall um, last Policy and Planning Committee, I went through the findings um, with you. This report was just me compiling the findings, um, and now we're at the point where we can make it available to the public, which we're required to do. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity to so view the report, but also ask me any questions if you had any before we make it available. <coughs> Good. 
Councillor, I'm oh, sorry, Councillor Wilson. Uh, I was reasonably comfortable having read the reports and, and particularly the explanation from uh, Ms. Gow there as we, we did discuss this this one earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite happy to move recommendation one and two. Thank you. Uh, any further questions before we, we go to that step? No? Can I have a seconder for that then? Councillor Wong, thank you. All in favour? No. Right, and then it'll just be if there's any other um, questions about any of the other strategy and plan development um, that's identified in that report. Any further questions? No. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dow. So we are now on 9.2. Thank you. And that is page uh, 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 38. Yes. Okay, in the absence of Mr. Kalkin, um, who's currently on leave, I'll present the report relatively briefly. I'll largely take it as read, um, but do just want to highlight the um, ongoing outstanding work by James Towers Consultants around Mayor's Task Force for Jobs um, program. As of April, they were the top in the country in terms of placements. Um, so it's continuing to be a really successful program mm -hmm. for our district. Mm -hmm. Um, but happy to answer any questions sitting in there. Um, this is a, a question so much as just a recognition to this council that um, because we have consistently been at the top of performance in these task force for jobs, we've received... Can another... I just stop you there? Sorry. You need to stop that. Yeah, we need to stop that. Okay. It's not public information. Very good. So are there any um, further questions of that report? Yes, Councillor right. Wilson. I'd just like to, um, in the absence of uh, uh, Mr Kalkin, pass on our thanks. I think it's um, it's it's a good report. It's a lot of good detail and mm -hmm. information there. And I think it's uh, it's relevant and paints a, paints a picture which has got information in it that I think <coughs> some of the other staff can work towards. So yeah. it's a good report. Mm. I enjoyed reading it. I agree. I think it gives us... Um, really good overview of what's happening and um, very, very informative. Um, yes, no, excellent. And also I'd like to say that um, I was very pleased to see under Local Insights the um, collaboration um, with Business Rangatiki or Rangatike, um, especially with our new Macron. Oops, don't know how, is it, has it gone through yet? No, it hasn't gone through but we've just added it, which is great. Um, so, yeah, no, that looks great. And the fact that Business Rangatike um, promoted the, um, the use of paint so um, avidly. Um, and so that's a very good outcome. Thank you. And, and quick, actually, the council, isn't it? We're yeah. all <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, any further comments or questions on that one? Well, just to say that the... Um... This deals with economic activity yeah. and also therefore deals with the environment we're currently operating in. And I would have to say that the agricultural environment is in a depressed position at the moment, like all of the country. But that will prove to be challenging um, for our district. Yes, very much so. Thank you. Um, yes, so um, I'm happy to move the receipt of that report. Uh, seconded by His Worship. Thank you. All in favour? Aye. Thank you. Carried. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Now, eight point, back to 8.2. Thank you very much, Katrina. Page 20. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Ms. Harris. Ms. 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 Harris, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, so I'll mostly take my report as read, um, but at a high level, this report covers um, an update on our bylaw and policy work program. Um, also something new in there, we've just, we've recently gone through and just 
reviewed all of our bylaw review dates. So some of those have been updated. Um, we also present the draft Rangitake District Council operating unmanned aerial systems on council owned and administrative land policy. Bit of a mouthful. Um, but this draft policy incorporates the direction that this committee provided at the last committee meeting. Um, and then also the report touches on and provides an update about the Mokai Bridge Bunty Jumping Bylaw, which the committee also asked for at the last meeting. Um, so today I'll be looking for a recommendation for the draft drone policy in the Mokai Bridge Bylaw. So happy to take any questions on any of that. Um, I have a question. Uh, so just, sorry, uh, on page uh, 21, so that's 4.1.7, at the bottom it says, um, it, it identifies that there's an education issue around the fact that we don't actually have, to have our own rules around or already rules under the CAA, um, et cetera. Where, so uh, what... What will our staff do in that in that area? Are we go, are we looking to do educational comms? Is that the sort of thing you're recommending? Um, we can do that as part of adopting this policy. If that was um, what you wished us to do, um, I don't know what the rest of the committee think. But um, if that is something that's been obvious and identified, I would I would like to suggest that would be a good thing. Mm. Well, could that be a staff yeah. undertaking? Thank you. Yeah. Anything further from anyone? This was um, very comprehensive. Thank you. There was a lot to read. <laughs> I had to go over some of it several times. Um, no one in the room. Oh, yes, and once again, down in 10, decision-making process 10.2 on page 24, it also talks about um, using other methods to educate social media, et cetera. So that just follows into what I said before. Thank you. Councillor Hilmer, I had her hand up. Oh, sorry. Um, Councillor Healor, did you have a question? No, I didn't have a question, but I was, um, I was going to support you in the seeing whether or not we the um, communication or the promotion of, of what this new of, of what's needed in this can be put out to our community. Because I was just thinking whether or not it's actually um, what was our liability uh, within it, because I, I feel like it's not just us that needs to be putting it out. I'm sure that the Ohaki itself must have a an ability to put information out to the, the community. Well, not really, other than to say that I think it's the educational side that we're sort of getting at as to a lot of people now, you can buy them in the toy shop, you know, mm -hmm. how they fly. So it's more an education, which is what I think um, we're suggesting is do some education. I think there is probably an obligation on our heart here, but um, they probably wouldn't be, they'd be more interested in ensuring it didn't happen rather than educating people. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Thinking of security and what have you. So the more education that we can do even on the social media areas is just indicating that it is not um, permitted. It's probably ben, the best that we can do. Yeah. I can imagine Ben could have a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just be wary mm -hmm. that you're going to ask to sit on one or do something. Uh, is that satisfactory, um, Councillor Hebrewa? Yes, yep, absolutely. Thank you. Other questions? Suggestions? No, so we're looking at uh, recommendation one. Yes, yeah, Councillor. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm happy to second. All in favour? All right. Thank you. Uh, so we're looking at recommendation one. Yes. It's been done. Yeah, number two. Oh, it's received. We can put on recommendation two. Either. Um, that we recommend to council that the draft lungs on, drones on council owned and administrated land policies adopted with or without amendment. 
okay, sometimes you do you want to consult or no? No, no. So okay. Councillor Wilson moving. Seconded. Thank you, Councillor Lambert, with one L. Okay. All in favour? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and recommendation three, that the policy and planning mm -hmm. committee, sorry, yes, uh, resolved to let the Mokai Bridge bungee jump in the bylaw, and I think we all agree that, um, sorry, uh, Councillor Hewar, you have something to say before we go to the recommendation, or you're moving? I was moving um, that the policy planning committee resolved to let the Mokai Park Bridge bungee jumping bylaw 2013 lapse on the 30th of April 2025. Thank you. And can I have a seconder? Thank you. Councillor Wilson seconding. All in favour? Aye. 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 Very, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're good. 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 Yeah, we're Thank you, Ms. Pence, on behalf of Cheryl and Sue. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. So, as you know, the Section 17A review allows Council to consider um, the means of delivery and the cost effectiveness of delivering a service. Um, the Section 17A3B of the Act um, also identifies that if a review may not be needed, if the benefits of a re review do not justify the costs of undertaking a review. And staff um, felt that perhaps this section was relevant in the case of the campgrounds, um, noting that there's limited alternative options for delivery um, and a review was conducted in 2018 and it's not felt that the situation has changed significantly since then. Happy to take any questions. I thought we'd already dealt with this one, to be honest. But I'm, I'm, after questions, I'm happy to move in this direction. Councillor Wilson? Well, again, just going to move receipt of recommendation one. Thank you. I'll second that. Thank you. Worship seconding. All in favour? Aye. All right. Um, I was interested in 2.4, if I can ask. Um, so that's on page 31. Just, uh, it says current income to council, et cetera, and including plus operating grant of $22,000. Is that a council grant or is that an external grant? It is a council grant, the operating grant, yes. Thank you. Um, and I was also interested in 3.3. Uh, I wonder if you could expound on the last sentence where it says council may relax these requirements of satisfied that the entity for delivery is community group or not for profit, et cetera. And then the last sentence says this discretion could not be used for any of the current providers. So at uh, the moment, the current providers are like individuals, mm. so they're not um, a non-profit organisation. So we would need to apply that criteria. Good. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, finally, sorry, I was very interested in this because um, I have had a lot of feedback um, from people on the value of camp campgrounds. Now, I myself am an avid camper as well, so um, I'm in this space. Uh, but when you say a uh, bullet point um, under number eight, uh, bullet point one, two, three, four, uh, three, um, it refers to a low contract value for four campgrounds. I wondered if, I don't, I didn't quite understand what that meant. It was um, like the total costs, right. like the income to council and the costs of the providing. Yes. 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 So that's service. low contract value yeah. because it actually costs us yes. quite a lot. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Very good. Any further questions, Councillor oh, Councillor Wilson? Uh, no question. Looking to move to recommendation two. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I'm happy to move uh, 
is uh, is not required for council camping grounds. In the words of the recommendation, it's not. It's not. It's not required. Is not, right. Yeah. Very good. Can I, do I have a second on? Councillor Hiroa, thank you. All in favour? Carried. Thank you very much. And we are now on to, thank you, Ms. Clunts. Um, and now we're on to 9.4, which is page 42. And once again, that's a day, please. Oh, Mr. Toomes. Thank you. Welcome to the table once thank again. You. Draft procurement and contract management policy. Yes, thank you. Uh, hopefully the uh, cover report speaks for itself. The draft procurement and contract management policy uh, is being currently reviewed by ELT. So we thought we'd provide an update today. And since putting together the report that you see in front of you, we have identified three changes we'd like to make to the policy, draft policy. So I'll kind of talk about them before we take questions. Yes, sir, sir. Uh, the first... Of the three questions, one is quite significant, and I'd like to thank Councillor Picitura for alerting us to this earlier on today. Uh, second one's important, but not particularly big in terms of words, and the third one's largely um, a tweaking of words. So what's not in the draft procurement policy is something that um, New Zealand's procurement, I'm just trying to find the right, the right phrase, uh, there were some purchasing guidelines put out by New Zealand government procurement a few years ago and establishes three categories of government organisation, some of which are mandated, some are expected, and some are encouraged to um, focus on Maori procurement, procurement mm -hmm. from Maori organisations. Mm -hmm. uh, we are one of the third categories there. We are encouraged to, and I'm, I'm not totally familiar with the details, including our policy to actually achieve, I think it's about 8% of our procurement from Maori organisation. So that's not in the draft policy yet. We need to get a better understanding of that and incorporate that. I think that's fairly non-controversial, but regarded by elected members. That's a guideline that comes from central government. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, th thank you. Councillor Pickett, you obviously alerted us to that. Um, something else that's not in the procurement policy, it's important, but I don't think particularly uh, hard to incorporate, is uh, the draft policy is silent on us piggybacking off of all the government contracts. And I think that's important to get that incorporated. And the third the third uh, tweak is in section 6.4.2, uh, where it currently says the procurement of more than 5K, but less than 50K, requires two in quotes, and an exception to be signed off by two members of ELT. I'd just like to uh, reduce that to one member of ELT. Just an administrative streamlining. So they're the three changes we've identified we'd like to incorporate. Uh, but the, the purpose of today was really to see if the committee had any thoughts on where we are. I just think, um, Madam Chair, that perhaps I'd just like to point out that this does introduce a tenders board in here. So one of the questions that we've had since I've been here is how do you get familiar with what is going through and get used to the process? Mm -hmm. And the suggestion here is that um, you would have two elected members that actually sit on that tenders board so that everybody is aware. And therefore, when it comes to council for noting, um, there would have been involvement of two people and so we can imagine that you're all busy people who would need a number of there that couldn't be able to sit on there. Um, the only slight reservation, or I have two, one slight reservation is that, remember, as part of the new budget, we have provision for an additional um, governance support of which the tenders board would need that person. Mm -hmm. um, Mr Toombs has an idea that you might be able to get one on sooner. I'm not sure that it's that easy to reel somebody in, but... Um, just making people aware that if you are adopting this immediately, then it may take us some time to get that in place. Um, 
And if you're saying that's why this amendment is necessary, it's so that we just we only need one person. No, that's no, a that's total separate. different. That's mm -hmm. a total different mm -hmm. issue. That's okay. um, approving our budget. So right. no, this is still you would have two um, two, elected two elected members. Elect members from a pool of um, of others. Um, and I do think that you would you'd probably need to reconsider this policy at some time as to whether a tenders board is required long term as well. So this is a matter of getting everybody familiar with it. So that would be a decision of the council at, at a point in time in the distance. In the future. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And I accept the chief executive's comments and provisions there. But I have a couple of other issues that I want to raise within this that are in terms of changes. So do we have any further comment on what this, what the LC has just shared? No, so we can move move on. Thank you. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. Councillor Loudon. Just um, re okay. regarding that, um, apart from the tenders board and and the involvement of elected members, um, I struggle to see where the government's arm fitted into this procurement strategy. What levels do we do governments get involved? Um, and there is no sort of boundary limits or understanding of what, what what aspects do we get involved in? In my experience, this has been an operational thing. Procurement yeah. is uh, standard business aid, business as usual stuff. Yeah. Governors, in my experience, haven't, uh, unless it's well, strategic or political importance, yeah. don't get involved in day-to-day -day procurement. So this is for day-to-day -day procurement, yeah. not? Oh, no, it covers the, the big ticket stuff. Um, I think section 6.4 talks about Procurement over half a million. Just check. Fifty thousand. Two fifty. And then it goes to the tenders boards where government governors would be involved. The governors are more set in the big projects in setting budgets as opposed to the procurement. Uh, but it's not, it's not to say that you can't ask to be involved in the procurement process as a kind of an overseer. Um, yeah, normally they are they would be reported because you've already set in your LDP or your annual plans you've set what you're going to do and so this is then a process that ensures that there's you know the correct procedures and what have you have you are uh, followed and then that's generally a note noted to a council that they've got you've gone ahead and done these things this does bring some overview by the governance arm into the um, <coughs> the approval of those and, and makes them part of that process. It's as if we have been through a procurement process for a, a large ticket item, and it was brought to the the, the um, government's table to make decisions. And one of the issues was that there was a limited understanding of the government's arm of what had been before. And I was just, I just don't quite understand. Madam Chair, can I just ask a question yeah, to clarify time. something? The uh, councillor, um, do you refer to the uh, tender recommendation reports? And normally that's what we do is at the end of the process, we do a summary. And really what that's about is to say to councillors, we have followed the procurement policy. These are a summary of the steps, and that there is allocated budget allowed for in this in this financial year, and that really is what we present to council at the end. What we are proposing with the tenders board is to allow councillors more view of that process to be sure that the process was transparent and fair, and everybody had a go at it. And so it's a bit more detail around the process. So then I would imagine once that tender recommendation does arrive, that the rest of council have confidence that that whole process was actually ticked off in accordance with the policy. I guess, Councillor Simon, you're referring to likes of the process for Taihepi and for here, where we've been tr trying to get a more detailed project plan that you can see what the points that the councillors are involved um, in, the, in the actual process itself. Yeah, but my concerns were sort of around the significance of the project, the risks involved, all those sorts of things that, that we're sort of, and the money involved, and that we we tend to have a um, um, a view of, or a say in, um, but we, we're at the, at the end of the process, apart from 
what you're saying now with the tennis ball with two people on there. Yeah, so it's whether we're whether when we're setting up a major project yeah. about a project plan yeah. that we've got in. So yeah. you're saying that that's not included in here. Well, I'm just trying to work out yeah. all the low level stuff is fine, but when we get to the bigger <clears> stuff, yeah. um, I'm not sure um, where this process involves enough of the government's arm. This is the first time probably the government's arm, government, government's arm is totally involved, but I, I think you're talking more of um, project management planning and involvement in that mm. front yeah. end as opposed to the pure procurement policy. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I'm not sure whether we've got that covered in any yeah. way, in any um, documented way either. So you've made, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Your okay. Worship. Um, we re rely to a large extent on the level of delegation that somebody can authorise purchase. So the big items will always be covered by government decision by a government's decision part of that process. Um, so this is pulled in that process into this into alongside procurement. So I tend to take my view of the chief executive and Anna here, where um, they're involving us in a far greater range by way of information as well. But it doesn't break, doesn't get away from our responsibility as governors. And Gordon, yeah, what, what His Worship's talking about is the um, delegations to position yep. policy. So we yep. actually had that. Um, we've just done a review of it, and it's coming back to council at the end of this month. So that'll be a reminder of um, where, exactly what Arno said before, where something's already set in a long-term plan, um, and you've made a decision to go down a certain path that's covered in that um, position policy, whereas the procurement is more around sort of day-to-day stuff um any one-off that's not covered elsewhere I, understand, I do understand what you're getting at yeah. just yeah. give me a chance to think about where that would appropriately come in because i do think there's been a policy change that allows um the governance arm to be more involved in those project management stages but um, but just let's think where that needs to come in and maybe i'm not sure it's under the delegations mm. policy because that flicks it out but Maybe there's a policy that says you'll be involved in for the um, reasons that you might say for something controversial, size of, or you know, it's some, give some criteria as to when we would put that project in front of council. It's just that when we do get that across the council table and we get to make a decision, it's a, a yes or no. And what happens if it's a no or you no? Know, um, you're put in a position where you totally agree with something or you don't agree with something and where does it leave you and where does it leave us? Um, inevitably, sorry, through you, Madam Chief. Yes, so ine inevitably, there has to be a decision point and if that decision point is no, and I can think of some very, very big projects, for instance, in Wellington where council has said no, um, then that it's up to the officers, if it deemed not against the principles of the motion that has been passed, to bring <coughs> a, a a different option. You know, so subsequent to your decision, I take your comment and and possibly that there should be a link to the delegation or reference to the delegations procedures under um, other existing policies that are listed on page 57, um, that would provide the link to it. But there is another, I've always believed that there is also another process that sits alongside the delegations in terms of, of one of sensitivity. So if the chief executive, for instance, or staff is concerned that, some, that they have the right to do something, but, uh, but it's of such a sensitive nature, they think it's appropriate to bring it to council, and that's what tends to happen. And that, that, that's happened on a number of occasions. For instance, you might get 
for argument's sake, a a person that an existing contract within a community that everybody thinks will naturally get a position, etc., um, but doesn't meet the criteria for some reason or other, and it's within the the staff members right to make the decision on the delegation that might be something that for example that came back to council mm -hmm. council wilson uh, you just good you just very quickly i think we could just break this up a little bit this is a procurement process so we're looking at and i think it comes to what council Loudon was saying we when we have a decision to make on something we go well we have a we have a need that needs to be done or we have an issue that needs to be fixed so we ask about why are we going to do it? What is the thing's going to do it? This is actually going, this is the part that answers the who's going to do it. So we need to split these two things out. One is a project, and the procurement side of it is the who do we get to deliver, deliver the project. Mm. So we have to split these two things out a wee bit. And I think what well, what I'm hearing from Council out is the first part is the why are we doing the project and what is the need for it and what is the benefit we seek? And that's where you're going to have a lot of governments, governance input into it. As to what is the benefits of it, what is it, how does it fit within the council's long-term strategic goals and views and deliverables? That's at that end. This is when you get to the next end of it, and you go right. Well, who's going to do it? How do we deliver? Who do we get the best people to do it? And from what I can see in this document, it has got a much much higher level of engagement with with us as um, as as governors, even if it's not to be in a purely and simply. Um, decision-making role within that tenders board, but to actually be there to, to be able to follow the process through. And and given the um, the size of whatever the projects may be, it would seem to me, and it is it is written in there, um, that we would seek outside guidance or non-conflicted expertise onto that, uh, onto that board for the evaluation process. So the two quite different things. One is why are we doing the project? This is the who's and how are we going to deliver it part of it. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the two other matters that I'd like to look for inclusion. Thank you. Um, the first is one around the, the principles, and I'd like to see somewhere in there the inclusion of an environmental, climate, or carbon lens. And I note that it is on page 57, mm. but I think that, you know, we need to demonstrate, and it's part of our climate change policy, mm. that we include it in decisions on procurement. Second one is on page 51. Can I just ask, where, where would you see that included? What's it say? Under principles. I think it is the uh, 5.36. Yeah, consideration of so to achieve the principles of sustainable procurement and climate change. Okay, oh, I must have missed it. I read it. My apologies, if that's the case. The other one was on page 51 and uh, 6.4.3, where two members of ELT, including the group manager, et cetera, but not including the group, and two elected members. I think that, that would, I'd like to see a note there that they, probably the words aren't suitably qualified, but suitably trained. So um, <clears throat> somebody will have had to go through some process so that they're familiar with the bounds in which they can operate with them, etc. So on that question, yes, right. So under that second bullet point would be two suitably trained elected members. Yeah. Because I think these people are being placed in a position of responsibility and trust. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they need some training to understand it. So that if, if you're going to go to that suitable, that sort of level of position decision making, mm -hmm. um, you know. I, I, can I ask a question of um, Mr. Benedict? Um, sorry, could you interrupt? Um, just wondered, did you not say that actually as part of that process with having the elected members there, that that would actually introduce them to that process? And so are you saying that as those members would then actually get a training in being part of that? 
or, you, or, or do you agree with His Worship that, in fact, they should have pre-training? I I 100% agree with His Worship. I, I think a bit of up, upfront training would be very helpful. But then as we move along, they'll become better and better and better and we should add them. I think it would add a lot of value. And, uh, as, and further to that, would you see that our staff could train the, our elected members in that for that role? That's an interesting question. I think we would have to have a look at the market and see what's available out there. Um, and then we can make a, a decision on that. Um, if it's something we do in house or get some external. Uh, I would imagine local government procurement is a topic that comes up a lot. So I would imagine there would be some training available. Perhaps through LGNC at all. Possibly. It could be the other way. You have staff members that come, <coughs> that come in that have no knowledge base of procurement <laughs> or local government. And the training would be necessary for them as well. For staff and for elected members, in fact. So, did you have a further, sorry? No. Did you have a further, something further you were going to say, we should, with those are the two main know. ones? Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Aldon. I just fine. wanted to add to maybe those members could be part of the Risk and Assurance Committee as, as well. Mm, possibly. I don't even think they have access to the independent chair. Mm -hmm. That was all. Awesome. I just don't want to labour this, but um, I'm, I'm not quite sure where it goes, but I do want to highlight it. And I think it's important that if you're going to have a tenders board, there will be plenty of times where we're going to need a very keen person sitting on there. So how do we highlight that as a best practice in there? At the at the forefront, rather, it's kind of in there, but I can't quite find it now. It's a little bit hidden um, that it might be an, uh, an opportunity to have some suitably qualified expertise, depending on whatever it might be. How do we get it forward? It is in there formally under 6.4.3. Yeah, quite a long way down there. That's the point that I'm making. Is it something that should be at the front end of the policy rather than the back end of the policy? That's an easy enough fix. Yeah. Yeah. I, did, I did see it in there, um, uh, uh, Kevin, but I just thought that I think it's important it's enough that it should be yeah. a consideration at the front end rather than the, mm. at the bottom. So Mr. Turns has taken that on as, a, as an undertaking. Thank you. Good point. Anything further? Oh, yes, Councillor Nardo. Oh, 6.4.6. Uh, all contracts entered into the, by the RGC must be in writing signed by all relevant parties and held securely and dated. And dated is what you'd like that added? Well, well we, we the council. Oh, yeah. 6.4.6. 6.4.6. Yeah, Madam Chair, I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. uh, I was astounded that there was a, a contract that was found that didn't have a date on it. Mm -hmm. And that's also taking us undertaking. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Peter, did you have something? Uh, just a comment um, to ask about 6.4.3 and the two elected members. Um, I'd, I'd ask whether or not um, it, why we wouldn't have the Mayor as one of those people. Just, I'm just interested to know whether or not uh, the mayor is one of those people or there's an addition of the mayor plus two. I'm just asking a question, not saying to do it, but what's people's thoughts on that? Sorry, I tend to agree in principle, but I can think of many councils around the country that have had a mayor that may have come in with no knowledge of local government, no knowledge of procurement, and and councils where the mayor hasn't been a popular voice of the <laughs> but, um, but in principle, I think it's a good idea. But maybe the training could cover that. Yes. Can, I just say uh, that? can I just continue on with that, please? Sorry, sure. Uh, am I allowed to just make another comment on top of that? Councillor Hebel, yes. Kilda. Um, so I know this is a uh, future focused um, document. Uh, I would have thought that uh, I would have thought that um, uh, the mayor should be part of it. To, uh, uh, that just makes sense to me. Uh, so if there's training for a, 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 a mayor as a newly elected mayor, for instance, in future, uh, there's nothing to say that uh, every every other elected member is not a newly elected person as well. 
So uh, uh, anyway, I just I just thought I'd just throw it out there to see what where people sit in that space. Kilda. Councillor Wilson. I don't think it's required to be mayor. Can I just point out the the mayor is an elected member? Oh, come on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just thought that maybe the two things is with recommendation one or make a second recommendation and that a panel consisting of elected members um, be appointed, which I think is what you do for councils appointing to specific jobs, um, mm. and that give a date that the procurement and contract management policy would be adopted. And I'm just looking at Arno here as to when they're coming in and they're thinking maybe that's in August, which will give us time to get organised as well, and so that it would come into pay on in August. So then I do think you need a panel, and I do think points made, but also one of the thing, one of the benefits of this tennis board is probably there'd be prescribed meetings set every week mm. um, and cancelled if there's nothing up. But I know that people are very busy too and are often away. So if you had a panel mm. of trained people, then you'd just be picking. Um, and whether you wanted to prioritise them to include in the media, um, we practical, that's, a, that's an issue that you can talk about later when you actually point those that are interested in being on that panel. Do you have any further comment about that? Would anyone like to comment on that suggestion as is recommendation two? So recommendation one, we'll get that out of the way. Um, I'm happy to move the re that report be received, draft procurement and contract management policy be received and recommendation, thank you, seconded by Councillor Wilson. All in favour? Thank you. Um, and so that, that um, LCE I was just going to say, and that a panel of elected members be appointed. We put a member on our members? Well, I wasn't being specific about that because it depends on whether people are interested or not. It has to be more than two. But yeah. does also you reduce the risk of both of them leaving at the end of a term? Yeah, that's true. If there are more, you retain the skill. Well, I'm happy to put a, a, a number of five. A panel of, of more than two? Well, that's maybe a. Is that a panel of more than two? Yeah. Elected yeah. members. Is that a panel of more than two elected members be appointed? Be appointed to the Tennis Board. Yeah, to the Tennis Board. Madam Chair, if you'll excuse me, I'll get an item. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Wilson. Thank you. And thank you for representing our beautiful district down there in the, in the big smoke. I'll hold that thought. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Thank you. Worry about a quorum. Yes. This last one. Yeah. Um, and, the, and recommendation would be three would be in that the procurement and contract management policy be adopted um, in August 2024. August 2024. Are we happy with that one? Yeah. So, uh, would you like to move that? Yes. Uh, moved by His Worship the Mayor, seconded yep. by um, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, that's both two and three. Yeah. Two and three. Yeah, yep. two, two and three. three. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. luck. All right, see you later. All in favour, say the mic here. Have you got that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. Very good. Well, no, we did so it. So, we no longer have quorums. Right, so we no longer have quorums. So we will close this meeting and thank, thank you everyone for um, attending. Thank you staff for your fabulous reports and support. Wonderful. And thank you um, Chair, Lady, uh, Councillor Hiroa, Christy Ora Hiroa. Thank you for attending on, on Zoom. It's not easy. And um, yeah, have a, have a great weekend. Kilda.